Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy. When a man gets divorced, he spends a lot of time moping around about the things that he's lost. It's difficult to get up in the morning, it's difficult to get going and get back into your regular swing of things. That's kind of what the Middle Ages was like. But for that man, there comes a day that he wants to just get up, shave, put on some clothes, and get back into life. That is the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a period of time between about 1450, which was the fall of the Eastern Empire, and about 1700. The Byzantine Empire had just fallen, so there were a lot of refugee Byzantine professionals, scientists, mathematicians that were emigrating to Europe, mostly into France. Ironically, uh, the Moors were in Spain, bringing their culture to Europe through that route. Renaissance means rebirth, and this was the rebirth of culture in Western Europe after many years of stagnation in the Middle Ages. There was an infusion of lost knowledge from the ancient world, the Greeks, the Latins, and they were being studied. Universities were being founded. However, society was undergoing great changes, both politically and especially religiously. Uh, this was when the Protestant Reformation began. And with every new movement, especially a religious movement like that, there's a lot of spin going on. So, for example, the Protestants wanted to represent themselves as the religion of the future. Unlike the Latin Church, which was stuck in the past with Aristotle and Ptolemy, even the name of the period, the Protestant Reformation, suggests that the Protestants were seeking to position themselves as the religion of progress. You could have easily have called it the Protestant Emergence, but they chose the word Reformation to imply that they were an improvement on the old. They wanted to position the Latin church as being old school, old fashioned, old ideas, a dark age. Now, while there was science being performed during the Renaissance, the major thrust seemed to be one of redevelopment of culture. With art, with literature, this is the time of Shakespeare. Rather than simple drawings, you began to see the use of perspective in art. The Gutenberg printing press was developed, allowing the mass distribution of information. Not only was this information relating to historical documents and science, but you had new versions of the Bible being printed. This was the time of Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, Michelangelo. We saw Copernicus and Kepler develop the heliocentric model and offer an explanation for why we saw what we saw in the sky. Notice that the shape of the earth was not in question at this time. It was a globe. The question that they were answering was, what does the solar system look like? And at that time, there really wasn't a good way to determine the difference between the two. They were both equally valid based on what we could see with our Mark I eyeballs. That was, of course, until this gentleman came along, Sir Isaac Newton, with calculus and the universal law of gravity. This was a sea change in our understanding of the solar system. Now, with Newton and gravity, we had an explanation for the movement of the planets. We had a mechanism by which we could explain their movements. And as a result of that geocentricism, Ptolemy and Aristotle went by the wayside. Following the Renaissance from about 1700 to a little after 1800 was called the Age of Enlightenment. During this time, science and reason were favored over superstition and religion. Great strides were made in astronomy and chemistry and physics. The steam engine was invented. This is the time of Cavendish. Sir Edmund Haley of Haley's Comet fame did his doctoral dissertation on a method to use the transit of Venus to determine the distance of one astronomical unit and discern the size of the solar system. And even though he wouldn't live to see the transit of Venus, he knew when it was going to occur thanks to the work of Copernicus, Kepler, and Newton. As a result, the 1760s were known as the decade of the transit. And during the first transit in 1761, some work was done on determining the distance to the sun. But politics, war, and poor planning prevented a systematic study. This was corrected for the second transit in 1769. Scientists were sent all over the world to observe the transit, including Cook and Mason and Dixon. Uh, over 130 teams were sent out, and all of the data was brought back to London, and the calculations were made. And a very accurate determination of the distance from the Earth to the sun was finally achieved. This had been the dream of man since the time of Aristarchus in 300 BC. The measurement capability was simply not there until that second transit. Celestial navigation was refined and the sextant invented. 
The longitude problem was solved using extremely accurate quarks developed by the Englishman John Harrison. And in a side note, while Cavendish is most noted for his experiments on gravity, we need to recall that his goal at the time was not to measure big G. He didn't really have a good idea of what that was. He wanted to measure the density of the Earth. And the interesting thing that he found was that the Earth's density was much higher than that of rock and very near that of iron. This was the first indication that the Earth had an iron core. Now, while the early 19th century is generally known as the Industrial Revolution, I want to extend the Age of Enlightenment a little bit into the 19th century for a couple of reasons. Now, while there were professional scientists in the 17th and 18th century, there was an awful lot of amateur work done. Here is the Shamrock Banks Observatory of the 1850s. This is Red Hill Observatory, the home of Richard Carrington. Carrington was an amateur astronomer, and on September 1st, 1859, he observed what has become known as the Carrington Event. The Carrington Event was a massive coronal ejection from the sun, resulting in a geomagnetic storm that damaged telegraph communications throughout the daytime side of the Earth. The reason that I'm mentioning Mr. Carrington is that he was an amateur, very much like me. It was the Shamrock Banks Observatory of its day. This was the time of the gentleman scientist, where amateurs made significant contributions to scientific knowledge. Now, like Carrington, the tradition of citizen scientists continues on. This is from Shamrock Banks Observatory, and the crosshairs is an asteroid that I'm measuring the orbit of. Uh, many people like me are out there with eyes in the sky looking for new asteroids and comets, and occasionally even discovering one. I haven't been lucky enough to do that yet, but it's not from lack of trying. If you'd like to see what we're doing over on Shamrock Banks Observatory, go to the Shamrock Banks Observatory YouTube channel. And while you're at it, have a look at our telescope fund. See if that's something you'd like to contribute to or have some interest in. Now, this is the close of the second section of my series on the history of the Flat Earth. We've got a lot of the background information done, and I want to finish up with two events that occurred in the early 19th century that were pivotal with this. The first one was just a scientific achievement, the discovery of Neptune. Neptune was discovered after orbital abnormalities in Uranus and other objects were noted, and they pointed to a gravitational source in the general vicinity of a specific location in the sky. When scientists trained their telescope on that location, they found a massive new planet, Neptune. They specifically looked for it based on gravity and Keplerian orbital elements. However, probably the most profound event that occurred was Darwin and his Origins of Species, the theory of natural selection and evolution. This led directly to the next and final section of this series, and that is the rise of the modern flat earth. I hope you'll join me for it. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe, and I'll see you again soon. Too deep for